I want to get started right away on our upcoming panel talking about the causes, costs, and how we overcome polarization in the church and in the nation. We have a wonderful lineup here for you. Um, I'd like to introduce a wonderful ally in what we're trying to do here this week, and that's Father Matt Malone, the president and editor-in-chief of America Media. As you know, Father Malone has for a long time been a champion of civility in our public conversation and has advanced that effort both on the pages of America and in his many speaking roles around the country. He's reminded us that importing political categories and language into Catholic conversation is not only inaccurate, that adds to division and can weaken our efforts. He's praised your efforts here at this event in a recent column, and I know is eager to get this conversation started. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Father Matt Malone. Thank you. It's indeed uh, my pleasure to be with you uh, this afternoon. Uh, thank you for the invitation and congratulations on this convening. It is really a remarkable uh, achievement. Uh, I was asked to uh, moderate this conversation uh, about the topic as it's listed in your program, uh, though not to as necessarily assume an, a position of uh, indifference uh, in the conversation because um, uh, as Kim said, I have uh, for a number of years now in America been addressing this topic. Those of you who have uh, read my uh, column or uh, perhaps used it to treat occasional insomnia uh, <laughs> uh, are aware that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a drum I've been beating now for, for the five years that I've been at America. And it really began with a, uh, an essay that I published in America in the spring of 2013 called Pursuing the Truth in Love in which I identified uh, the uh, ideological partisanship as uh, a dire threat to the ecclesial dialogue and that it was the mission of the Catholic press in this country to respond to that. Um, that essay is probably best remembered for uh, its banning of the words uh, liberal and conservative when referring to Catholics in an ecclesial context. Um, they, I, I should say just at the outset that it, we were told that that would be an impossible thing to do or that it would be incredibly hard to do. And uh, I said, why? We're, we're writers. We'll just find other words. Um, and it, it turned out to be something relatively easy to do, but important because when you have to say, some of my fellow Catholics believe X, Y, and Z, rather than simply conservative Catholics think this or liberal Catholics think that, it, it changes something in your head and most importantly, in your heart. Um, and I suppose that that's just the second point that I would make uh, in this opening, which is to say uh, the question, what are the causes of polarization, is an important one. And there are answers to this question. Uh, but in a certain sense, in my own experience talking about this topic over the past uh, five years, I've come to see that that's not actually the most important question. That in a sense, the most important question is who uh, are, are the causes of polarization? And the answer to that question is as uh, simple as it is elusive. The, the answer is, is you are, and I am. We are the causes of polarization. And unless we are able to uh, acknowledge that reality and to repent of what we have done and what we have failed to do, um, then not much will change. The good news about repentance always is that it gives us the opportunity and the grace to change. In other words, if the problem is always someone else, if, polar, if someone else is always the cause of polarization, then we are powerless and we, will, we are at the whim uh, of events. But if we take personal responsibility for it, and we see that uh, we ourselves, the personal responsibility of which the Holy Father spoke, um, that we ourselves are in some way complicit in it, well then, now, there's something that we can do about it. Um, and we all are in some way complicit. I mean, how many of us uh, have stopped reading opinions with which we disagree or talking to folks uh, who vote differently? How many of us in places deep down we don't really want to talk about sometimes derives some satisfaction from creating another or a them by pressing like or send on something. You know, the 2016 presidential election was one of the closest in American history. Second time in 25 years that 
uh, a person won the popular vote and lost the White House. Yet the majority of Americans live in a congressional district that voted for either Mr. Trump or Mrs. Clinton by more than 10 points. So we, we don't even live with the people with whom we disagree. The third and final point that I would just make by way of opening is to say that <clears throat> there are many causes of this phenomenon. Uh, and we're going to talk a bit about them today and how to overcome them. And I'm going to ask each of our panelists, whom I'll introduce in a moment, to say a word about that. But I do think that the fundamental cause uh, is the spiritual crisis that we have in this country, but also throughout the West, that is a result of the secular age in which we are living. You know, if the, and I don't wish to scapegoat or to blame secularism, I mention it only by way of explanation, not blame. Uh, but if we live largely in a cultural milieu, as uh, Charles Taylor has described, in which uh, we are cut off from the transcendent, and there really are no truths or ultimate goods beyond this world, then what concerns only this world becomes very important. And our debate becomes a kind of mortal combat. And uh, the locus of meaning and uh, of purpose switches from the church to the state. And our politics becomes liturgy. And our politicians become priests. Uh, that's a very dangerous position in which a self-governing people can find themselves. Um, you know, in the end, polarization requires only two poles. Not two people who disagree with each other, but two people, because that's actually what democracy requires, people who disagree with each other. But two people or groups of people, each of whom believes that the other is somehow intellectually or morally or spiritually irredeemable. Um, and that is a, a people who are incapable of self-government. So this is a very serious, serious topic. And I'm, I'm very grateful to uh, have this opportunity to address it again and to have this really wonderful panel offer their insights about the problem and the solution. They are probably well known to you. Uh, I will not uh, be uh, long in introducing them, uh, but to my right, uh, literally, not the other thing. <laughs> uh, Scott Appleby of the Notre Dame Keough School of Global Affairs. Sister Patricia Chappelle, the Executive Director of Pax Christi. Uh, Elise Italiano, the Executive Director of the Given Institute. And Hoffman Espino, a theologian at Boston College. And I wonder if we might begin just by going down the uh, panel. Uh, I wonder if we might begin just by offering your thoughts on the topic, the causes, uh, and the, um, uh, the causes of the problem and the solutions to that problem. How do we explain polarization? The challenge is not how do we explain polarization, but how do we explain the previous panel which indicated that Catholics have somehow held the center? That polarization is not difficult to explain. I'm 61 years old. We didn't start the fire, but it's been raging just about since I was born. It, there's not a cause and effect, I hope. But during the period that most of us have been alive, historians shouldn't particularize a period and say it's different from others in some radical sense. But one could make a strong historical argument that the, the times through which most of us in this room have lived have been extraordinary. It doesn't take too much time before I was born that air travel began. And then we have a new age of globalization in which time and space has shrunk in a way unlike previous generations and centuries. In our own lifetime in this country, just think for a moment the traumas that this nation and this church has been through. Um, beginning, you can begin where you like, you can look at Vietnam, you can look at the loss of confidence in political leadership that we sometimes associate with Watergate, but there are crises around that, that trauma to our belief in institutions and in leadership the terrible uh, trauma of Vietnam for the country, moving forward to 9-11. So, I'm not going to take the time to unpack for you the history of the last 50 years or so, but it has been a period not only of dramatic change and a centrifugal forces of all kind, but also rapidly. 
In the previous panel, there was a mention of the millennials, and one of the big challenges for millennials and the reason they've left the church in such significant numbers is the LGBT question. That's a generational shift. It's a remarkable shift in what my children are millennials. That, that happened like that. I could spend the rest of our time together in this session uh, extrapolating on this one point, that change has been rapid, it's been often traumatic, it's hard to absorb, and so the question is not why are we fragmented, the thing that to be explained is how have Catholics, in a way, attempted to hold something like the center? That's what needs to be explained. I can come back and elaborate that point later. The second point, what do we do about it? Since I've got two minutes, let me, uh, let me address that. Uh, but I, I will take a chapter, I was asked in the kind of preparatory emails about this panel, I directed a Peace Institute at Notre Dame for 14 years. I've been in, engaged in that. And I had an aha moment at, uh, at the hands of a good friend and mentor who's from the Mennonite tradition, John Paul Lederach, really worldwide renowned uh, peace builder. For many years directing this Peace Institute, I thought, okay, we've got to get to a point of peace. And this is what peace looks like. And here's the social and economic and, and moral state of peace. And I was waiting for us to get there. Of course, this is a naive and silly thing. And he, John Paul was writing books that were more sociological in the first part of his career, talking about how do we negotiate conflict. He had his pyramid, you know, you go with the, the middle out, not the top down or the grassroots. You, you identify the people in a conflict setting who can reach up to the elites and also to the grassroots. He's doing that kind of sociological stuff. Then about midway through his career, he started writing books like one called that I commend to you, The Moral Imagination. In this book, he started talking about metaphors like cocoons and spider webs and platforms, and this is what it is to bring peace. And I took him aside and said, John Paul, when you're over your midlife crisis, would you get back to the sociology, <laughs> not the haiku, not the zen, not the cocoons and webs? And then I was called by Providence, because there was no other reason for me to be called, to lead a retreat of Mary Knoll's sisters from around the world for a month at Mary Knoll. And I, thought maybe I wasn't giving this mortal imagination book a chance, so I assigned it to the sisters. They immediately got it. They understood. Of course, a web. A web has points of contact that are strong. Maybe for Catholics, the Eucharist would be one of them. And you can think of others, family, um, the historic witness of the church. And the web can be destroyed very quickly by violence, by conflict. But if those anchors are in place, the spider builds the web again over time. Or a cocoon, which is a nurturing. So the, the overall point was peace is not something we are, uh, you know, terminus ad quem and now we've got it. It's actually an ongoing process of building cocoons, webs, platforms, moments and oases and initiatives of peace within a broader context that can be often conflictual and deeply violent. The book goes into real concrete conflict settings about that. What does that say to our situation as a polarized nation and church? It says that a way forward in what in fact we have been doing, which is gets back to that Catholic middle, is we find ways to come together to seek common ground, to have dialogue, to work in these vital parishes, to work in universities. And what we can reflect upon what we're doing conceptually in a way is we are building these webs, we're building these cocoons, these platforms, that sustain us over time. The church is sustained. Continuing education, education continues, peace building continues. In a way, we might want to shift our lens and ask ourselves, what is the goal of decreasing polarization rather than accepting in a way we're in a generation and at a time in history in which this is our fact of life. It's not going away soon. What are our strategies within that context and I would submit for now, hope to elaborate later, there are strategies of building these webs, these networks, these life-giving intra and inter movements and networks that the church is so good at historically. That's the appropriate response, I think, to an ongoing polarization that after all is historically understandable. Sister? The, the causes of polarization that, that we observe in our church and in our nation today are certainly not new. I would agree with you on that. What is new are the overt manifestations of hatred, hostility, and bigotry, and the equally intense reactions and feelings that get 
evoked in the face of such rage and anger. The polarization in both our church and in our nation, I believe, has the seed that gave birth to those roots is the seed of racism. And racism that runs so deeply in all of our social institutions in the United States. And unfortunately, our dear Catholic Church, my brothers and sisters, is not exempt from the scandal of social sin. Somebody say amen. amen. <laughs> for, for today, we are observing a narrative that, that is rooted in a sinful and warped worldview being played out because the worldview has become our reality. And if I can allow, I'd like to explain that. I define racism as personal racial prejudice plus the misuse of power by systems and institutions. For racism to work, someone has to have power over someone. Things have to be either or, right or wrong, good or bad, and these lists of opposites keeps the systems working. This country was founded by and for white men. Laws were enacted uh, to maintain the, the, the power and privilege of white men. And then when white women received, got the vote in 1920, they colluded and fell right in, right in line. Because of this power dynamic, human beings are forced to come to this new country for economic reasons. We're not considered human, nor treated as such. Most of us in this room have read or seen films about the Middle Passage, the slave trade, plantation life, and death. You may have even visited some powerful museums in this country, depicting in pictures, in quilting, and sacred relics, the torture and cruelty inflicted on our brothers and sisters. You leave these viewing experiences troubled, saddened, and disturbed. However, we pack that experience away somewhere and go on with life. Why have we not been taught, taught to question the stark reality of the why behind this brutality? Why have we not confronted the role and influence of whiteness in the reality of racism? Why have we not sought repentance and transformation for this sin and taken redemptive actions to redress this wrong? Why has life gone on as usual for most of us? But for those of us in the room of African-American ancestry and heritage, that nightmarish reality of racism is deeply embedded and seared into our souls and psyches and has become a vital and critical part of our historical memory. We never get a break from our racial reality. The history of chattel slavery in the US is rooted in a sinful and warped worldview that over the years has become our US reality. Racism is our reality, and we have all failed to understand how racism has damaged all of us. We African Americans have been damaged by internalizing the racial oppression that we live with day in and day out. This oppression is defined as a complex, multi-generational process that has taught people of color to believe, accept, and live the negative social definition of ourselves and our roles in societies. This has profound ramifications on our self-concept and self-esteem. It has left us never feeling competent enough, good enough, professional enough, and the stress of overcoming that is killing us. Members of the white community, you also have been damaged by internalized racial superiority. This is also defined as a complex, multi-generational process that teaches white people to believe, accept, and live out superior definitions of themselves and their roles in society. White privilege manifests itself in finding excuses and explanations for hurtful and or inappropriate behavior, becoming defensive and hurt when our looking good strategies fail us. The thought of soon no longer being the dominant racial group in this country is in part what seeded the, lo the slogan, Make America Great Again. Connected to racism is the other narrative 
that we do not make connections with what is happening in our nation today. It is easier to pit people against each other than it to see us how we are all connected. The bitter and hateful reactions to immigrants, DACA, dreamers, and refugees seeking asylum or wanting to remain in the US, along with the refusal of this country to admit people from certain Middle Eastern and African countries, my brothers and sisters, have you connected all of these? Have you made the connection? All of these are people of color. Have you asked why Puerto Rico, still ravaged by the hurricane that destroyed the island almost a year ago, and that in recent days, the death toll of 50 is now estimated to be 5,000 more deaths by more than the Twin Towers disaster in New York City. These are American citizens who are all people of color. Do we see the connections of what is happening at the Mexican border? Those being denied due process, having their children taken from them, and living in cages are from communities of color. Young men and women of color have been murdered in our city streets, and there is little to no accountability or outcry from us. But when white, upper middle class students in Florida are shot, there is national outcry and demand for sensible gun control. Don't you see the connections? I could go on and on with examples, but will suffice it to say that this is institutionalized, systemic racism at work, and we wonder why people are polarized. Right now, we have at least eight people running for state and federal offices who are white nationalists and are proud of that fact. They are neo-Nazis who, den who deny the Holocaust, have a profound hatred of Jewish, Islamic, and black people, claim association with the KKK, fear that they are becoming the white minority, and who believe that diversity in any form, but especially racial diversity, is not a strength, but a weakness, liability, and threat. Racism is the seed at the root of what divides us. And now our beloved Catholic Church, if I must say, has also the seed of racism embedded in it. The sociology of religion tells us that religion has two functions, to maintain the status quo, to engage in and bring about social change. In order to maintain the status quo, Mun must rely on tradition, keep a strict, impermeable border between church and state, and play nice, so to speak, to power brokers. If you want to maintain the status quo, then in the midst of social and political turmoil, the response is silence. On the other hand, in order to engage in and bring about social change, one must take the gospel and Catholic social teaching seriously. One cannot be silenced, but a risk taker and a public one at that. It's been widely accepted, at least in this country, that churches speak with moral authority on issues affecting the common good. However, no one can remain silent in the midst of great social turmoil and still retain any moral authority. There is no such thing as a political issue without moral consequences. The 300 plus years of racism in the United States was for the most part met with silence from our institutional church. There were few who spoke out against the institution of slavery, pleading for their owners to allow their slaves to be baptized. The conditions of slavery under which these children, women, and men were living and working were not challenged. Even after emancipation, a few churches did open schools for children, but there was never a concerted effort on the part of our institutional church to issue and, and address the root causes of slavery. During the civil rights movement 200 years later, no real response from churches in the US is forthcoming. The writing of pastoral letters on racism was an exercise of a few bishops because these efforts were not proclaimed from the pulpits in our local parishes on Sunday, nor were the tenets of the Catholic social teaching. We have recently begun efforts by the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, as we all know, to address the sin of racism. And only time will tell what that will be. The cost to healing our nation and church of the polarization caused in racism will be risky. It will cost white people their comfort 
and will cause people of color to work together instead of pitting ourselves against one another. The question becomes, how do we create a space for the old narrative of racial oppression and privilege to pass on in order to allow what is emerging in the hearts and minds of so many of us to arrive? What steps need to be taken towards interracial reconciliation and healing of psychological and social wounds caused by racism? I suspect that part of the answer lies in truth telling, allowing ourselves to truly listen to each other without interrupting, butting in, judging, or matching what we've been through with the pain of another, mutually agreeing on what issues will be addressed, analyzing our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, being accountable and responsible to each other by following up and showing up, being courageous enough to ask our church to assist with affirmative redress to the sin of racism, needing concrete plans of action or else all of the above will be an exercise in futility. The face of our country and our church is changing. It is getting closer to the actual black brown face of Jesus to Christ. How welcome will we make this Jesus feel? Amen. Thank you, sister. Tough acts to follow here. <laughs> Thank you, sister. Um, I'd like to focus uh, less on the causes and more on the costs of our intra-ecclesial uh, polarization issues, particularly as they might affect millennials. Um, about 10 years ago, I was teaching high school women just across the wall here at Georgetown Visitation, and I would bemoan their bad behavior by calling them millennials. And then soon after, I learned that I was one as well. Um, and so though the data changes a little bit by those conducting surveys, millennials are those who came of age at the millennium, usually born after 1982 and before 2000. So the youngest um, are eight now. Uh, as we know, the combined story that Pew and Kara data tell us about millennial Catholics is not a hopeful one. There are some who say the glass is half empty, some who say it's um, half full. I don't know if we can even see a glass present here when it comes to this story. Uh, millennial Catholics are disaffiliating from our church at an unrelenting rate, um, and for some time that disaffiliation now has been happening at younger and younger stages of development. As a church, we've told ourselves that millennials will come back once they are married and have kids, but by and large, they are neither marrying nor having children. If they are, they're doing it later, and many are not doing it in the church at all. A recent America Media and Kara study on Catholic women in America reported that 17% of millennial women attend mass at least once a week. Mass attendance, of course, translates largely into more engagement with lay ecclesial ministry and outreach to the poor and vulnerable. Kara, a different Kara study reports that 80% of lay ecclesial ministers are women. So the fewer women engaging in their faith at a younger age paints a dire picture for our parish and social justice ministries. Christian Smith at the University of Notre Dame fills out this picture with his own research with the National Study on Youth and Religion. His study reveals that millennials share similar characteristics across the board, whether or not they are religious. We are, by and large, and this is just briefly, um, a, a summation, highly anxious, skeptical of institutions, transient, unable to defend a moral framework beyond our own intuitions and feelings, which means we are also unable to identify goods um, or even common goods. We can't speak to what people hold in common. And we are putting off long-term commitments, which will affect vocations to marriage, religious life, and the priesthood. I'd add, I agree with Cardinal Supich that we are also quick to sniff out hypocrisy and we resent inconsistency. I think it might be helpful to see real quickly a brief tour of my own uh, coming of age story in terms of a timeline. I, this is not my so-called life. I'll move very quickly on this for those millennials who remember um, that show. Um, at age 14, I witnessed the Columbine shooting um, in my freshman year of high school. And so instantly, a place that should have been a place of security um, and stability, a high school, uh, became a place of mass carnage. And we've only seen this grow exponentially as the years have gone on. At age 16, I watched the Boston Globe break the story of the sex abuse crisis. And while my faith in the church and Jesus Christ and in the institution survived, I can't say the same for most of any of the peers that I grew up with. At age 17, a year later, I watched the Twin Towers fall about an hour north of my home. And while our country rallied around a common good in America for what seemed like a quick moment, um, in the years following, we saw uh, politicians extreme 
uh, embrace extreme positions on war, abortion, guns, and immigration. Uh, millennials have grown up really in the divided states of America. Uh, at all of this time during childhood and young adulthood, we saw swaths of our parents, aunts and uncles, and grandparents divorce, which left us searching for identity and distrusting the institution of marriage, um, even the possibility of a lifelong commitment. We then entered college, and we graduated crippled in debt as higher education costs were almost insurmountable, especially with interest rates climbing. And we were told to go to graduate school because with the changing economy, we would need more than a bachelor's degree. Uh, I graduated at the beginning of one of the worst economic recessions since the Great Depression. The fact that I've had a career in the church is nothing short of a miracle since that time. On top of this, a third of our generation has been lost to abortion. Thousands of our peers commit suicide every year. They're addicted to opioids and dying of drug addictions. And as reference, there are more mass shootings um, and, and shootings amongst police um, and young African Americans and people of color than we can count. And abroad, our peers are facing one of history's worst refugee and migration, cri migration crises, and those in the Middle East are being martyred for their faith. We have our own culture of death, which is different than the one John Paul II spoke about in the 20th century. So increased polarization in our church is only adding um, on top of this uh, fire. For those who are already disaffiliated, our intra-ecclesial wars might not matter, uh, though it might um, not be welcome here, uh, this thought, you know, our public floggings of one another on Twitter aren't really noticed by more um, these people at all. They really don't care. Um, <laughs> but for those who have stayed in the church, and I, I hesitate, but for many who are in this room who are emerging leaders, or so we've been told we are, um, as millennials, it's hard to ignore that the polarizing attitudes and language that many of our mentors and guides are embracing is not affecting our hope for the future of the church. And while the intra-ecclesial debates about Pope Francis, continued culture wars, fights over how we're supposed to implement Vatican II take place, our peers are being carried out in spiritual body bags in front of our eyes. Two weeks ago, uh, some of my friends here and I were at the USCCB's Young Adult Ministry Summit, which is a gathering of national young adult ministers across the country. And the sentiment from those on the ground is that we are in triage mode. We're not really helping people to learn what it means to be Catholic. We're binding up their wounds and trying to teach them how to be human. Apart from helping young people to sort of stop bleeding out, I think it would be helpful if our established Catholic leaders turn their attention to millennials, um, not just in a selfish reason, but because investing in our formation um, is going to be really helpful for advancing the common good, as John and Kim have outlined here. Christian Smith says that religious millennials are more engaged in the public square than our non-religious peers. Statistically, we're more involved also in non-religious social and institutional connections, associations, and activities, and we volunteer and help the poor at a much higher rate. Statistically, the issues that matter most to millennials, at least to the women surveyed by America and CARA, are the church's social teachings. We care about, um, very much, abortion, care for the environment, migrations, physician-assisted suicide, the death penalty, etc. Millennials intuitively embrace what Pope Francis has called the integral ecology. We are rejecting, by and large, the progressive and conservative pro-life versus social justice labels. We see the integrity of the church's sexual, social, and sacramental teachings and realize that when they're cast aside, the poor are disproportionately harmed. Um, I also just say, as an anecdote, it's hard um, working in the church these days because if you uh, go to one side of the aisle in the church and try to advance a particular common good with one group of people, another group of people sort of refuses to work with you, publish you, or lock arms with you. And so it's kind of dangerous to have a career in the church right now because you don't really know where to go. Pope Francis has turned his attention this fall to an upcoming synod on young people, the faith, and vocational discernment. I'm kind of shocked that some people are turning like, the, the, the volume down immediately by questioning method, motivation, um, methodology of what's happening. And young people are kind of refusing to let that deter them. And they've offered two solutions as a way forward. And I'll leave with this. Um, they've asked the church for a few specifics. The first is that they've asked the church for a new moral vocabulary. They're begging us to try to find another way of explaining our moral truths and social teachings to them. We can't just say the same things in the same way. I think often of my mother, who when we went to Italy and she met my dad's first cousins, kept saying louder and louder in English what she wanted, which was quite embarrassing. <laughs> and eventually, when she uh, tried Italian or showed them what she wanted, uh, there was a breakthrough. Phrases like the preferential option for the poor, the common good, the unitive and procreative dimensions of sex, the culture of life and death, aren't resonating with young people. They can't see it, they don't know. So we've gotta come up with an ever ancient and ever new vocabulary. 
And the second is that they're begging for credible witnesses. They keep saying, stop telling us what the church teaches and show us how to do it. And so they're asking for mentors, and I think by and large, they're asking for one-on-one -on -one help because they don't have naturally occurring communities anymore in which um, learning how to be Catholic, seeing how the social teaching is done in their lives, um, they don't have that anymore, and so they're desperately seeking out one-on-one -on -one help. So it's not a great story, but there's hope if we turn our attention to what young people are asking for. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to share a few thoughts uh, on this important uh, topic of the causes of uh, polarization. And I um, want to put on my hat uh, of uh, theologian uh, to uh, just analyze uh, some of the dynamics that were shared in the previous panel and some of the thoughts that I bring to this uh, conversation. Uh, there have been different perspectives about what it means to be a Christian from the very beginning, from early church. You know, uh, a few months ago, I was able to publish a, a chapter in the book that Do Dr. Bruce uh, actually uh, mentioned earlier uh, in her presentation uh, on overcoming polarization. And in this, um, in, the, in, this book, in this chapter that, uh, that I wrote, I actually shared that, for instance, if one looks at the schools of Alexandria and the schools of Antioch, you know, those were two very different schools of interpretation, biblical interpretation, theological interpretation, but Christians in those two schools saw themselves as part of one community, one church. Another example of difference among Christians, and particularly among Catholics, is what happened among, uh, with uh, Euro, uh, US Catholics at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, when they were engaged in this big debate about whether to be more Catholic or more American. Those who argued for being more Catholic were perceived as more traditional, more conservative, those who argued for being more, uh, Amer uh, more, uh, more uh, American were perceived to be more progressive. However, they saw themselves as part of one community, one church. What I think is that today what we are witnessing is a profoundly ecclesiological challenge. We are journeying as a fragmented church in the United States of America, deeply fragmented church. We got a democratic church that is walk, walking in parallel to a Republican church. We have a white church walking in parallel to a minority or better, minoritized church. We have a middle upper class church walking in parallel to a church of people who are primarily poor. We, got, we have an established church that is walking in parallel to an immigrant church. Technically, we have the old dilemma as walking in parallel to them, us versus them. So we need to keep in mind the fact that there are many Catholics in these minoritized groups who are being pushed into becoming part of the dominant group or the predominant group. You know, they are being pushed to becoming white or becoming Americanized or choosing to do so in order to survive sociologically, politically, and even to survive ecclesiastically. I'm not, this is not ecclesiologically, but ecclesiastically. To survive in the church, they got to embrace certain practices and certain ways of being. This is becoming a question of survival for most of us. A process in which you know, we are losing the cultural, political, in religious soul, in, re in religious soul. In this brief analysis, I want to bring attention to what I want to call the victims, the losers, and the forgotten ones in a climate of polariz polarization. And I want to bring up you know, four, uh, four, uh, four points in here. One, who are those victims, the losers and the forgotten? Those peoples whose lives unfold in the realm of the not hot button issues. Usually, people who live in poverty, people with low levels of education, people who are undocumented, they are invisible. They are treated as non-persons. They are the victims 
of, the, of this polarization. Nobody cares about what's happening to these people because we are engulfed in our highly intellectual dynamic uh, uh, disputes. Who are the victims, the losers, and the forgotten? People whose issue, issues are so hot button that they are often avoided, dismissed, and even condemned. For instance, LGBTQ, LGBTQ Catholics, women who are victims of violence and domestic, uh, and domestic violence, victims of massive incarcerations, mostly black and Latinos, victims of racism in our communities. Who are the victims, the losers, and the forgotten in this climate of polarization? People who are new to the polarization battles in the United States of America, particularly immigrant Catholics and the young. And we just had a, a, a brief uh, presentation on this. Let's not, you know, let's not forget that about 25% of all Catholics in the United States of America at this very moment are immigrants. And between 55%, 50, 50, 55 to 60% of all Catholics in the United States under the age of 18 are Hispanic. These immigrants and these young people are inheriting the battles, battles that are not theirs or battles that they do not understand. So the flesh and blood, let's not forget that these losers and that these victims and these forgotten in the battles of polarization are flesh and blood people, are women and men with real lives, with names, with families, and they should not be reduced to statistics or issues or merely problems. And it is when they are reduced to statistics, issues, and problems, then that it's easier for us to use them as footballs in, a pol in, in, in this polarized uh, battle. So my final point here is we need to really come to terms with the fact that we are entering into a new Catholic moment in the United States of America. And this new Catholic moment in the United States of America is being defined by highly minoritized voices that are forgotten in the midst of these battles. We are not paying attention either, neither to the present or to the future of Catholicism in this country. Thank you. I think that that's a, an exceptionally useful survey of the, of the issues that we uh, face when we're talking about this topic. Uh, I was reminded during the presentations on the data uh, just before this um, of, it's particularly in, in uh, the analysis of how people really identify as Democrats who happen to be Catholics or Republicans who happen to be uh, Catholics. Um, I was reminded uh, as a novice, I, one of the first pieces I wrote for America was, uh, is there such a thing as a Catholic vote? And I interviewed uh, Andrew Greeley um, which is, it was the, uh, the event of a lifetime in and of itself. <laughs> so, um, it was like trying to make a martini in a tornado. It was just a constant <laughs> stream of ideas. But uh, he, he would make the point that, uh, he would make the point that there, there, there wasn't really a Catholic vote in the way that say there was an evangelical vote. And uh, because Catholics always went into the voting booth as something else who happens to be Catholic. Right, and that might be it. Might be uh, it, uh, it. might be a union worker who happens to be Catholic, or Latino who happens to be Catholic, or a white person who happens to be Catholic, or an upper class person, or a working class person who happens to be Catholic. And I, I think that that reality was true then. I think it's still true today. I think that's what the, the, the data bore out. Uh, my question for the panel, and please, anyone can jump in at any time, is, is that a, is that a good thing, or is that a bad thing, that um, Catholics don't identify in the public square uh, primarily as Catholic. Uh, well, <laughs> I would think I, 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 I would I, think I, I, that I nice this crowd would that can agree that's not a good thing. Um, but I'm not so sure I accept the premise. Just to be provocative, mm -hmm. I'm not so sure that even though in a way the data speaks fully against this point, 
But the other conclusion, that is to say, I would, I would suggest that um, people are formed as Catholics and they have a deep Catholic sensibility and it does show up in the way they vote. That's not the issue. The issue is how do they interpret the political climate? How do they interpret the issues before them? The other thing we're left with is that there is no formation in Catholicism that, that really endures. And I'm not sure we want to go there. This is not to say that, every, that the formation is always deep or profound or what we would like it to be, but if they're Catholic and they're self-identified as Catholic and they take the sacraments and participate in the life of the church, because they fall this way or that way, ideologically or politically, I don't think it automatically means they leave their Catholic sensibilities behind. I think they interpret them in a certain way. I'll give you one concrete example. I was speaking with a, uh, a family who has endowed a, the Cushwa Center for the Study of American Catholicism. And I should have named it because now I'll give away what they said. But I was, these are members of the family, I'll simply say that, that are reliably democratic progressive Catholics. And this is right before the election. And we were all already looking ahead to a Clinton administration, Hillary Clinton administration. And um, we, we were taken back at the dinner table by a couple of this very progressive Catholic family saying, well, you're assuming I'm voting for Hillary. I'm not voting for Hillary. And we were stunned, not that there are Catholics who would not vote for Hillary. In fact, the majority of Catholics did, didn't vote for Hillary. What was the reasoning? The reasoning was that, in the, uh, that came out in the last debate, Hillary pushed the envelope on abortion so far in that debate that it was a real, for her, from her point of view, tactical error, and that these progressive, liberal, whatever you call them, family, thought, you know, this is going beyond our sensibilities as Catholics. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't fall necessarily on that side voting, but there, my argument is there is a Catholic sensibility about, thing, about the sanctity of life. There is a Catholic sensibility, I think, about work. It's, it's how is it interpreted? How does the body, body politic present itself to Catholic voters? I recognize the data is against me on this, but why not throw it out there? If, if I may, uh I just want to say first that this is a very American question, mm. Father. You know, I mean, I myself, I'm, I'm an immigrant. I grew up in, in, in Latin America and South America, and I never heard that question. It was simply taken for granted that if you are baptized Catholic, you know, you would act a Catholic privately, publicly, you know? So I guess that speaking from that uh, particular perspective, and, and that's kind of the the, the perspective that millions of Latinos who are Roman Catholic in the United States also have, you know. So finding the best possible way to bring together this you know, faith and life, you know, and the public commitment as informed by the faith. And, but what I, would, what I would say is, and I want to go back to Dr. Miranda's question earlier, you know, I think that uh, I'm, I'm all in favor about Catholics being informed deeply, profoundly, by our faith in the way we act publicly, politically, culturally, etc., and artistically. But we need to educate ourselves much, much better, you know. Our understanding of what Catholic social teaching needs to be fully rounded, you know, integral. Our understanding of what it means to be Catholic. I mean, so many of the surveys and sociological surveys that were cited uh, here, or similar to the ones that were cited, often present us you know, uh, uh, data about Catholic, Roman Catholics in the United States reducing Catholicism to the one single issue, whether it's abortion or whether it's uh, immigration or whether it's labor, dy labor dynamics and so forth. You know? So we need to do a much, much better job at, at all levels, beginning with catechesis, but also the preaching and at the university level, tr uh, helping Roman Catholics to have a rounded understanding of what the church teaches, the best of the Christian tradition, the best of the gospel, then act accordingly. If we don't do that, I think that not only we lose as a church in terms of our public voice, but the society loses deeply. And my, my experience is also that I, I am really beginning to see, particularly um, as I have gone around the country and 
particularly working within Catholic communities of color, in terms of breaking open and breaking down the Catholic social teaching. Because in many of our communities, we were never taught or never even knew about the Catholic social teachings. I came to understand later, someone said to me, Sister Patty, a lot of white folks didn't know about it either, you know, when they was coming up. And, but what I, have, what I have come to understand, though, is that particularly in Catholic communities of color, as we break down and break open the Catholic social teachings, it's, a, it's, it's like a, a, an aha moment. People realize, number one, they feel empowered, number one. Secondly, it is very much in keeping with much of the, 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 the cultural norms that are part of those communities in terms of one does not operate from an individualistic perspective. But the sense of community has always been a, a, key, a, a key part of who we are and whose we are. And then, and my experience has been, people then seem to step up to the plate um, and seem to want to be, get more engaged and more involved uh, in, in, in asking questions, uh, in looking at uh, how do we do outreach uh, to the people in those neighborhoods, et cetera, because they have come to a renewed understanding, if you will, of the Catholic social teachings. I would just add um, one thought. I mean, millennials, by and large, generationally, um, at least Catholics, and this might just be um, people who I've talked to, are feeling increasingly so politically homeless that they feel paralyzed to do anything. I mean, part of this might be apathy, but part of it is not cast a vote. And I think um, the data was that we were just heard before this panel talked about, you know, sort of meta national the 2016 election, and we'll talk about Congress, et cetera. But having worked in a diocese and watched um, a state Catholic conference attempt to get people to even write pre-written letters to legislators for issues that dealt with all aspects of the common good. I mean, you can't even motivate people to hit send and just type in their name with an electronic signature. So to me, there's sort of like this, even on the local level, when things are handed to people, they're still not moving. And this, again, might be a generational thing, but th there's more than a national question at stake here. So we have a hard stop coming up. Uh, so this is our, our quick final question. Um, what, uh, what we, we just go right down the row here. Um, one specific thing that, uh, that, somewhat, that people can do to overcome this problem of polarization? I mean, based on, based on some of the remarks that I have heard, uh, no particular sister pad, and, uh, and what I was observing, I th and also the millennials, I would say, let's learn about who we are as a church. You know, we, we, we need to know who we are, what our questions, narratives, stories, our struggles are. And then we will be. We need to encounter ourselves. We, you know, we need to come together, and that will help us to move forward. Right. I would um, just kind of pick up on the theme that I had before. Every established leader um, in a position of influence, no matter how big the sphere, should be taking on someone who's showing interest in the next generation and showing them how they've done it um, and being open to how it might be done differently in the future. This uh, sort of practice of mentorship is becoming really popular amongst young adult ministers. Um, and we're, we're really begging you to take us on in that um, space. I, I would say that uh, there's a need, again, for uh, Catholic communities of color, again, to know themselves in terms of their cultural reality, their culture as it empowers their Catholicity, and to be and to and to be uh, appreciative of that, and to and to continue to find ways of being able to integrate that into uh, what we do in terms of serving uh, and, and serving others. And the other piece I would say, particularly, is that we we have to begin to learn uh, not to be afraid of the other, mm. not to be afraid of the other, and be willing to sit and dialogue with each other uh, without um, making judgments. I would say evangelization for participation. Yes. Evangelization for participation. Democratic institutions don't recreate themselves. Um, a very troubling statistic was that millennials and probably those coming up don't have a lot of faith in institutions. They can seem to be boring or corrupt or uh, not, not the thing to participate in. But I think we have to evangelize people to be part of their local political community, community state, national political community, and also in the same way to recommit to those networks, those movements, those 
parishes, those things that keep the church vital as well. So evangelize in our various sectors, education, ministry of various kinds for participation. Okay. Amen. Uh, and I would just propose uh, something that America has uh, adopted, the Catholic Social Media Compact, which we announced last January and we put out uh, in the magazine. It's 10 principles for action on social media. Um, and you can check it out at americamagazine.org. We're trying to hold ourselves to them, not always successfully, but we're trying. Um, the tenth probably being the most important, that before you press send, you say the prayer, Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. It's amazing what that stops you from doing. <laughs> Let's thank our wonderful yes. panel.